Thank you, everybody. Y'all may be seated if you would like. Thank you, Pastor Keen, for another chance to try and bring the word and minister to the people. I want to, I want to talk to y'all tonight about something that, that we ought to be seeing more of. I want to talk to you tonight about miracles. As if y'all haven't noticed from the song choices, that I figured it was probably pretty obvious what this message was about. But tonight I want to talk to you about claiming my miracle. Everyone in here, no matter who you are, you have something that you need in your life. Every one of us has something that we constantly pray about, something that we need the Lord to intervene in. Every one of us has a miracle that we need to receive. I want you to think about what yours is. What is the thing or things that you need in your life that you know can only come from God? Is it a healing or maybe a cure for an addiction or maybe even to be forgiven by the people you've hurt? How much different would your life be if you received what you desired from God? How much different would your life be if you got to wake up every morning free of those chains that hold you down? by your past, free of the chains that hold you down by the things that you used to be addicted to, free of the pain that you wake up with every morning that you medicate yourself with to try to escape from. What if your miracle was to be set free? How would your life be? All right. The word miracle in itself, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. It's simply something that occurs when God intervenes in our lives. You know, miracles can be anything from being able to wake up another day for some people, your bills somehow getting paid when you've run out of money, or even a healing that there's no doubt that God had to make it happen. You know, we, we all know, we can all claim that God still heals. We know this. We know that he still works his wonders. We know that he still provides. We know that he makes a way out of no way. But for some of us, we get the feeling that he only does that stuff for the other people. He only performs miracles in the other places. And that other church down the road, those other people, the, the more faithful people, not us, those people. To some degree, though, I will agree with that statement. But it may be our own fault why that is. It may be because we've become too comfortable. We have acquired too much stuff and don't necessarily have to rely on God like he intends for us to. We don't always get what he has for us because we sometimes put him off like we don't need him. You know, we, it's like the Laodicean age, Brother David. We, we're increased with goods. We are rich, but yet, at the same time, we're naked. You know, we, we try to be self-sufficient in this life, not needing to rely on others. But I'm going to tell you right now, I need my God. I need his guidance. I need his direction. I want everything that he's got for me. If he's got something for me, I'm going to take advantage of it. If I'm going down a path that he set me on and I stray off, I want his chastisement to bring me back into line. I want everything that he has for me. He wants to be our provider. He wants to bless us with our needs being met, but we have to do some things to allow it to happen. You know, we have to clear some things out of our lives and allow room for God to be God. We've got to evaluate where we stand and start reaching out in faith, we've got to reach out and claim our own miracle. The eighth chapter of Luke is one of my favorite parts of the Bible. It has a chain of events that happen that truly show that Jesus is God in the flesh. It shows the power and dominion that he has over this world and everything in it. If you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke 8 and 22. And this, this scripture is the start to probably my favorite event. And it says... Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over into the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. The disciples followed Jesus on a simple command of let's go to the other side. They had no idea what's going on. They just knew they were following him. The disciples followed Jesus into the boat, and they set sail to go to the other side. As they, and as they were out in the water, a great storm blew up. Now I want you to just imagine... Pastor Keen, you've seen these kind of boats that they were in firsthand. Brother Billy, it's probably not much bigger than your John boat that you got to take out in the river. But I want you to just imagine the little boat that they were in being tossed around with the men inside, holding on for dear life as the boat went up and down in the waves and being blown from side to side, taking on water as it went. I can only imagine the fear that they were feeling, trying to hold on and keep the boat afloat. And at the same time, looking in the back, 
looking at the guy that told them to get in the boat, he's back there asleep. Seriously, how would that make y'all feel if someone got you out in the middle of the river and you got out there behind a the barge and those kind of waves and the guy that got you out in the boat was asleep? You probably wouldn't be feeling too happy. But as they were fighting to keep the water out and stay afloat, they managed to get to Jesus and they wake him up yelling, Master! Master! We perish! Jesus finally arose from the back of the boat and rebuked the wind. And it says the raging of the water and there was a great calm. Jesus looked at them and said, where is your faith? And the disciples looked at one another and said, what manner of a man is this? For he commanded the winds and the water. And they had to listen. See, the disciples got their miracle. They thought they were about to drown. They thought they were about to die. They had no faith. They got their miracle. Why can't you? After the sea and the wind were calm, Jesus and his disciples finally made it to the other side. There was a man on the other side that needed the help that only Jesus could provide. If you skip down a little bit into Luke 8 and 27, it says, And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. And this man, the one possessed by the demons, he was the reason to go to the other side. But when Jesus stepped out on the land where the man dwelt, he saw Jesus and cried out and fell down before him. You see, even being filled with all of those evil spirits, he was still subject to the power and holiness of Jesus. See, Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of this man. The evil spirits had filled the man often, and because of this, he was bound with the chains and fetters, and he would break the bands, and thusly he was driven to live in the wilderness or in the tombs. And after coming into contact with Jesus, Jesus says to the spirit, he asks it what its name is. It says legion, because there are many devils that were in this man. And they sought after Jesus to not cast them into the pit. See, they, they knew who he was. There was no doubt in their mind that as soon as he come on the scene that they were about to leave. They didn't know where they were going. They figured they were going back down where they came from. But even to them, Jesus is a merciful God. They knew who Jesus was and what power he had. The Bible says that there was a herd of swine nearby feeding, and the demons sought for Jesus to allow them to enter into them, and he allowed it. And when they entered the pigs, they ran off the edge of the cliff into the sea and drowned. And when this was done, the people that were nearby watching, they fled, and they went and told of this in the city and in the country. And when the people went to see what happened, they saw that man. They saw him sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind and clothed. If that demon-possessed man can get his miracle, you can too. After healing the demon-possessed man, Jesus and the disciples crossed back over to the other side where they came from. And verse 40 says that the people gladly received them. When Jesus arrived, a man named Jairus, who was the keeper of the synagogue, fell down at Jesus' feet and sought for him to come to his house because he had a 12-year-old daughter who was dying. Jesus started towards his house. And the people surrounded him. And as he was being surrounded and heading towards Jairus' house, a woman, a little woman that had an issue of blood, was in the crowd. This woman had a constant flow of blood for 12 years and had spent all that she had going from doctor to doctor seeking, seeking help, but she only grew worse. I could only imagine the kind of pain and despair that this woman is in. Having that kind of condition for so long, you could just imagine how weak that she is, how small and frail she is, dirty. She's unclean by their custom. She's cast out. She probably doesn't have a home. She's homeless, no money, but yet she's still there. She's following Jesus. But not only was she weak and hurt, but in her culture, like I said, she was considered unclean. But she purposed in her mind that if she could only touch the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. And she fought her way through the crowd and finally made it to him and reached out and grabbed hold and immediately the blood stopped. And the scripture says in Luke 8, 46 and 48, or through 48, and Jesus said, somebody had touched me for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. You see, if she could get her miracle while Jesus was on his way to heal somebody else, why can't we claim ours? Why can't we get what what we need? He's big enough. He can take care of all of us. He's not going to be too busy for your needs. 
But as Jesus was speaking to the lady, you all know the story, there was a man that came from Jairus' house and claimed that the girl was dead and did not trouble Jesus about coming anymore. But the Bible says that when Jesus heard this, he answered him and said, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. But when Jesus got to the house, Peter, James, and John went in with the father and the mother, and they were all weeping. And Jesus says, Weep not because she is dead, but only sleeping. And it says that they laughed at him until scorn. And him, because they just knew that she was dead. Jesus took the girl by the hand and called on her to rise. And verse 55 says that her spirit came again and she arose. If Jairus' daughter can get her miracle, you can get yours too. In this passage of scripture, Jesus ministered not only in words, but in examples of his awesome power. You might be thinking, well, well, this stuff happened so long ago. Well, what about now? You know, there, there's still things that happen all over the place. It's just, why don't they happen here? This is a story I found. Uh, this lady, her name is Donna J. She's a missionary. She lives in Denver, Colorado, and she was on a trip to Ecuador. And this is her story. It says, following breakfast at our hotel, I and five members of the Ecuador mission team that I was a member of began to hear dogs barking and howling. We thought it was merely a dog fight because this was not an unusual thing in that part of the world. But however, amid the noise of the dogs, we could hear the sound of a woman screaming, wailing, and crying. She said it didn't stop. But after several minutes of the commotion, two men that were working at the hotel where they were staying at went out to look, but returned and looked as if it was nothing. And I said emphatically to our group, we needed to find out what was happening. And we all went out in the alley behind the hotel. The heart-wrenching screams were coming from a woman collapsed on the side of the road. Around the corner was a man standing as still as a statue holding a baby in his shoulder. I knew the baby was dead from the hopelessness of the mother's screams. My immediate thought was the memory that I had because I had lost a child. See, my daughter had been murdered, and I couldn't help her when she died. But in that moment, standing in Ecuador, I declared, today this mom will not lose her baby. Two girls, Sarah and Rasha, were also on the mission team. They ran and began praying for the distraught mother. I ran over to the man holding the baby. I wrapped one arm around his back and the other around the baby, and I began to plead with God for his life. I looked at the little face, fully expecting to see him to come back to life, but nothing happened. I was about to close his eyes with my fingers whenever the Holy Ghost said to me, you only close the eyes of a dead person. I realized that the Lord was telling me the next words I spoke would be either life or death. I began kissing the baby's face and told him, I love you, and Jesus loves you, and your mother is waiting for you. I yelled, Blink! His eyes closed and then opened, but it was not a real blink. Suddenly, I could feel the power of the Holy Ghost as I was reminded of scriptures that reminded me of the Lord's promises. The Holy Ghost said to me, you have a choice. As a believer, you have his authority to do this. The works that I do, you shall do also. Nothing is impossible with God. Speak to that mountain. You can close his eyes and give him up to death, or you can speak life back into him. And with that, I immediately commanded the baby, you blink now in the name of Jesus, and he blinked two times. His belly and chest began to gurgle with saliva, and it came out of his mouth onto the man's shoulder. Susan, who was another team member who had been standing next to me praying in the spirit with her hand on the baby's back, said, he's breathing. He's breathing. Within seconds, a police car came and picked them up to take the baby to the hospital, and then they were gone. See, we were all stunned. We're, we're sitting here thinking, did this really happen? Did God just do what we thought he did? He just brought a dead baby boy back to life in front of our eyes. And as a result, it was because of our prayers. We all went back to our hotel, and I began to sob uncontrollably. I was completely overwhelmed. And later that afternoon, the family came to our hotel to find the strangers from America who had helped them to show us that their baby boy was alive and well. If the baby can get his miracle, you can get yours too. You see, we, we can look through all the scriptures and see all the miracles that happened. And we can scour the internet and the books and read about all the miracles happening all over the world. But what about you? What does your miracle look like? Brother David, what does your miracle look like? What, is it all your kids sitting next to you right here worshiping God with you? Sister Sharon, what if you were to wake up in the morning not having another health problem? You didn't have to take no more medicine. You were just as healthy as could be. Brother GL, what about if you had all your brothers here sitting beside you? 
What's your miracle look like? You know, some of us, some of us have had things happen to us to build our faith. Some of us haven't. But I just want to give you a couple stories in my own life of my great grandpa. See, he's a kind of funny how to explain how he is. Meredith calls him a precious man, but I, I don't know about that so much. He's kind of more honorary to me. But in everything that he does, he is a faithful man. But whenever I was young, I remember him telling me about him having a sharp pain. And he went to the doctor to get checked out. They found out he had a hernia. And they scheduled a surgery to repair it. But my great-grandpa looked at the doctor and told him straight in the eyes, said, you're not going to have to do that surgery. He went home, he prayed, and when he come back, it was gone. It was completely healed. It was gone. Another occasion happened a few months ago. We actually prayed about this one here in the church. Another occasion, he went to the emergency room because he was having some back trouble, and they discovered that they had, he had a mass on one of his kidneys. And once again, the doctors, they were trying to figure out a way to get rid of it, but they were, they were struggling. I mean, after all, the man's 92 years old and still kicking. Yeah. He's kind of frail if he goes under the knife. But once again, he looked at that doctor and said, you're not going to have to do nothing. He went back in for that surgery, and it was gone. This one has been going on for a little while. The last instance that he told me about was he told me they discovered that he had cancer. He was seemingly healthy, and when he found out about the cancer, he told the doctor that you're not going to have to worry about it. I think it's been somewhere between 10 and 15 years since he told me that. He's still got it inside of his body, but it hasn't grown any. He's been praying that cancer away, praying it down the whole time, and he's still fine. But we know that God still works miracles. And if he can work them in him, he can work them in you. But I want to ask you again, what does your miracle look like? If you had to write it down on a piece of paper, what would it look like? If you had to proclaim it publicly to receive it, what would it look like? How would you, how would you act if, if God said that, I'm going to give it to you? but you got to step out in faith. So I'm going to ask you again, what does your miracle look like? And I'm going to let you know what mine are. Number one, the addiction to alcohol is going to leave my grandpa. That's the first one. He promised me that if he ever sold his motel, that he was going to put the bottle down. He sold it. It's time for him to man up and take and take his word. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. Because if it don't, it's just slowly killing him. It's going to happen. I'm going to claim it right now in the name of Jesus. My second one, my second miracle, is the addiction to drugs, legal and illegal. Every one, except for the exception of two, of my cousins, aunts, and uncles, are addicted to either illegal or legal drugs. And it's to the point where they've given up on their families, they've given up on their lives, they, they can't hold down jobs. It's ridiculous. But I'm going to claim it right now. It's going to happen. They're going to drop all that. <laughs> and the last one, which is probably the most important one to me, one of these days I'm going to look up and I'm going to see my mom and dad and my sister walk through that back door. So I'm going to ask you again, what does your miracle look like? If you had to name it, what would it look like? If you had to stand up and proclaim it, what would you say? What would you tell the Lord that you need? James 2 and 26 tells us that faith without works is dead. And this past Sunday, Pastor Keen told us that faith without works is dead because sometimes you got to get up and do something first about it. But I want everyone that would, I want you to take what you've got in your mind. Take your miracle that you have. I want you to prophesy to that miracle. I want you to throw it down at the altar at Jesus' feet. I want you to take a step back and declare it to happen. You've got to get up and do something about it. You've got to get up and claim your miracle. If they can get theirs, you can get yours. I ask you right now, everyone that would, if you would, just please come up here. Claim your miracle. I know everyone in here needs something. Everyone in here is needing something in their life. I just ask that you would come, throw it down at the feet of Jesus, and claim it.